morning. Hey, if uh, you're a guest here today, I want to say welcome to Valley Christian Center. As you can see, we love to worship our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And just as a matter of information, you, you notice that we raise our hands, and, and maybe that's something you haven't seen before. Well, you see it when people are at football games and basketball games and baseball games because they're, they're cheering. And so what we're doing is we are both cheering and submitting to our Lord and Savior. And that's what we do. It's an act of submission to our God. And so uh, try it sometimes. I think you'll like it. And also, if you're a visitor, we have this, uh, this connection card in, the front, in front of you, in the back of the seats in front of you, and we'd like you, if you're a visitor, to fill this out, and at the end of today's service, we're going to receive communion together, and we're going to leave our offering in this uh, silver bucket up here, and if you're a guest, fill this out and leave the connection card in the offering bucket up front. We'd just like to say thank you for coming and, and give you something for, for coming to visit us today. Now... We are now in the month of June, and you thought we'd never make it, huh? Those of you who got a school for the summer, we just finished a pretty uh, serious uh, series on, you know, fighting battles. It was pretty intense, and the beautiful part about the month of June is that it's considered the month of love, because the highest amount of people are either married or celebrating anniversaries are proposed to in the month of June. Did you know that? Conversely, the month of January doesn't do so well. The most divorces happen in January. So I'll have to work in a really heavy, heavy series in the month of January. Like, hang in there. You can do it. But for June, you know, we're talking about this series, Walking Tall from Fear to Courage. It really is all about finding a way to be content with who you are. And the goal of the series, if you look at your notes, says learning to love who you are, why you are, what you do, and where you are. The human, human being has this overwhelming desire to know they are wanted and that they are needed, they are desired by others. And we have noticed that those who are content with themselves are pretty much content wherever they are. And those who are not comfortable in their own skin, no matter where they go, they're just uncomfortable. And in this month of June, this month of love, as we are learning to walk tall from fear to courage, we're going to discover a little bit more about how God made us so that we can walk comfortably daily in our own skin. How nice would it be to wake up in the morning and say, I like who I am. To go through the day and say, I still like who I am. And then go to bed at night, lay your head on your pillow and go, you know what? I think I still like me. I think that's pretty cool. And uh, God would love us to live in that kind of experience. And this is not being selfish. This is just walking out what God created when he made us. Now, our series text today, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles 28 is after Kings and before Ezra. 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse, we're going to start in verse 20. Starting in verse 20. And this is our text for the whole series. 1 Chronicles 28, 20. Then David said to the Lord in the assembly, oh wait, David said to Solomon his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. Now why this is our theme text for the month of June is because of what was happening in this powerful transition time. King David was coming close to death. He had spent his entire life fighting to reunite the kingdom, to bring the people of God together. And 
he was about 60 years old and completely battle-worn for his years of fighting to defend the Lord Most High, to destroy the enemies of God, and to try to reunite the kingdom. At the same time as this transition was coming to an end, his son Solomon was beginning. And he began to cast vision into his son Solomon that his job was going to be to build the temple of the Lord. And so you have one finishing his transition, one beginning his transition. And each of them would have to learn how to be at peace with themselves because they had a destiny thrust upon them by God. In other words, David started out as a shepherd. We see nothing in Scripture that said he wasn't perfectly satisfied as the youngest of of many brothers out with the sheep every day caring for them. He seemed to be pretty satisfied with his life. But all of a sudden, something happened he could not ignore. There was a destiny that God had for his life. And the destiny was when he went to bring his brothers food, he saw this Philistine Goliath, black in the name of God. He saw the lack of leadership in the king, Saul. And he was compelled by God to pursue a destiny he didn't necessarily ask for. And so David lived a life of battle, living out this destiny that God had asked him. But Solomon, his son, was coming on the scene with a united kingdom. And suddenly he was having something thrust upon him he didn't ask for. David was giving his his son instruction to take everything, all the skilled labor, all the people, all the wealth, and to build this magnificent temple to God. Solomon was growing up under the king, under the protection of a dynasty, with all the wonderful, uh, fun things that come with being the son of a king. And suddenly, he was given a task, a destiny, a future that was overwhelming, that would take every ounce of his strength. What we're going to learn in this process is that you may have some ideas and dreams and goals. But the challenge is as you get closer to God, he makes his desires your desires. And you may be thinking, I I don't want that, but I do want that. Why do I want to do that? That's insane. Why would I do that? And because God begins to say, hey, uh, my child, I've created you. There's a purpose for you. And the closer we get to God, the more we begin to realize he definitely has something for us. And we're going to talk about all of this so that we may be men and women who live in peace. Because the world has no peace. And so let's begin. Part one of loving who you are is you were, crea- you were crafted with love. You were crafted with love. I love this scripture in Jeremiah 31.3 that says, The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. How can God have an everlasting love for you if you've only been on this earth X amount of years? How is that even possible? It is only possible if God had thought of you before you were even conceived. And he had created Because he is the ultimate creator. He had created you in his thoughts and his heart saying, I love, I can't wait for such and such to be born. And so he created you for an everlasting love, which means he thought about you with love. He had you conceived with love. It's irrelevant about your fleshly, your biological parents. It's irrelevant about the economics where you came from. 
What's relevant is the fact that your spirit was breathed into life from the everlasting love of your creator. That's what's important. Psalm 139, 13 and 14 says, For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your work so wonderful, I know that full well. I love with all these new babies coming and all these new parents. You know what I love to watch? Because now I have a new grandson. I get to watch him and I'm so excited. But you notice the mom and the dad with the baby, right? They, they know every nuance of that baby. If there's suddenly a pimple that, up, that comes on their thigh, they know about that pimple on the thigh. And they're concerned about the pimple on their thigh. And they wonder how they fix the pimple on their thigh. They know every nuance of that child. And what he is saying here is, irregardless of the love or hate you feel from other of mankind, God knows every nuance of you. And he is concerned about every part of you. And he is thinking about you all the time because he made your innermost being. He breathed life into you. And his motivation to have you have life was love. His motivation wasn't so you could make him look good by worshiping him. That's something we do out of gratitude. But his motivation was love. He wanted to see you come to life. And he is intimately aware of every single part of you. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Think about that. You are the ma- handiwork of the creator of the universe. Now, some of you are really good at hands-on handiwork. Some of you are not. We used to say in construction, there are framers and there are carpenter, and there are, there are carpenters, and there are finished carpenters. So a difference between a framer and a finished carpenter is a framer will get the stud to fit between the top plate and the bottom plate, okay? But the finished carpenter can make the edges of the molding look beautiful, If you take a framer and tell him to do finished carpentry, you're in trouble. The detail, he's not into the details or she's not into the details. You have someone who makes jewelry. They have to know how to look at every detail. If you have a dentist, you hope and pray they're into details. (laughs) Please drill the right tooth. Please fill the right tooth, right? So there are some things in life that you want craftsmen to be working on. And what God is saying is, I personally, with my own hands, crafted you. I made you. And look how he says it. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. He was thinking ahead about how he was going to use you. And so he made you in the image of his son Jesus to follow his son Jesus so that your life may live in a fruitful way. Everything about God is strategic. He has a purpose for you. Which brings me to the second point. You are desired by your God. You are desired by your God. There's a uh, comedian used to write in all the papers when people actually read papers, you know. His name is Dave Barry. You've heard of Dave Barry? And he says, What women want to be loved, to be listened to, to be desired, to be respected, to be needed, to be trusted, and sometimes just to be held. What men want? Tickets to the World Series.
or the Super Bowl, depending, or the World Cup. You are desired by God. There's something special about knowing that you are desired. Romans 8, 16 to 17 says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we, we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. You know, I want to say something. God did not create you just to tolerate this life. He created you to enjoy this life. God created you to be an heir with him. The story of King David and King Solomon are very much like this because King Solomon was an heir to the throne of David. He was chosen out of many sons to be the one that God was going to call to do this mighty work of building the temple. But we are called on this life to achieve what God has asked us to achieve, but he never says anywhere, even though there are times of suffering, he's never told us we're not allowed to enjoy or just to enjoy this life and just tolerate it. You've heard that saying many times, uh, life is hard and then you die. <laughs> I wouldn't make it as a motivational speaker if that was your motto in life. Life is hard, then you die. Deal with it. We're, to, we're to, told to enjoy life. I had to, you know, uh, I went to the doctors for my annual checkup. And they did this thing. They do this thing where you stand on this little weight and it, it does body mass index. You ever done that? Yeah, it's depressing. <laughs> so he's, he's going over everything. And he goes, hey, uh, good news is you have really good muscle mass. I go, what's the bad news? He goes, the bad news is you need to lose some weight. <laughs> And I, so he starts telling me all the things that I should be eating. I go, nope, nope, uh uh, nope, nope. And he goes, well, I go, look, I want to enjoy life, not just tolerate it. That was my line to the doctor. I said, I will make some adjustments, but I'm going to enjoy life, not tolerate it. I will not only eat plants. Sorry, it's not going to happen. Eat more beans. I go, eat more bacon. Bacon's the answer. <laughs> uh, he, goes, he said, I'll check you up in three months, see how you're doing. I said, okay, very good. But honestly, let's, think, let's, just, let's just stop for a second and think about this, really. Did God create us and this beautiful planet so we could tolerate it and then die? Is that really what he made us for? There should be some enjoyment in this process. And God wants us to be heirs with him, to enjoy what he's given us. It's a difference between someone who's an employee and someone who's an owner. I was having dinner at a Mexican food place last night, <laughs> eating things I shouldn't be eating. <laughs> and the owner of the restaurant, I love this place because the owner is out there running around. And I noticed she did something I never saw the uh, waitresses or the waiters or the busboys do. When they come out, the waiters and the waitresses, they wipe the table down. She came out, she wiped the table down, got down on her hands and knees and wiped the edges of the table. Because you know how sticky they get from kids? I said, an I looked at my wife, I said, the employee would never do that. But the owner, this is her place. She made sure the edges were clean. See? So you are owners, you are heirs with God of what he has created, you're not just servants. You're not just employees. And it's important to understand that so we can embrace the beauty of what he's created. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That's pretty exciting. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the wonderful light. You are a special possession. I used to have an, a Ford F-150 pickup truck. I miss that truck. I really do. When I was in building. 
and you needed a truck. And I made a lot of money with that truck, but I also had a convertible Porsche at one time. Which one did you think I left in the garage? I'm sorry, but the pickup truck did its job, but it didn't get the special treatment. The Porsche was in the garage. It was covered. It was always waxed and polished. The chrome was perfect. That poor little pickup truck looked like it had been through a terrorist attack, right? <laughs> its job was to make me money. But the Porsche was designed to give me fun. And so it was a special possession for me. God looks at you as a special possession, He doesn't stick you out in a field somewhere. He cares for you. He wants you to be everything he's created you to be because you are valuable in his sight. And even if no one else appreciates you, even if no one else cares about you, even if no one else appreciates your value, you are absolutely valuable in the sight of God. You're his Porsche. He sticks in the garage. (laughs) Next, your life makes a difference. Your life makes a difference. Satan is good at causing us as as a world to find our differences and use our differences to divide us. That's what he's good at. He's constantly trying to get us to find our differences and divide us. But Jesus calls us to find our commonality and to unite us. What holds nations together is Christ. Is Christians willing to find commonality? Right now, just yesterday, the most incredible thing happened. The Catholic Church was celebrating a 50-year anniversary of a Pentecostal Holy Spirit movement that happened in the Catholic Church. 50 years ago, literally the Holy Spirit moved through the Catholic Church and millions of Catholics got baptized in the Holy Spirit with this renewal. And so the Pope decided to have this anniversary yesterday, invited all the Pentecostal churches, 300 of them, including our Foursquare and Glenn Burris. And there they are with the Pope celebrating Pentecost, Catholics and Protestants. And guess what song they sang? Jack Hayford's Majesty. All these nations come together, Catholics and Protestants. Uh, Jack Hayford must have been pretty pleased with that moment. And there they are celebrating the Pentecostal movement 50 years ago, that asking God to renew it again, which it is coming, singing together a four-square song by Jack Hayford called Majesty. Is that incredible? Your life makes a difference. God is moving. He wants us to find commonality, not find things that divide us. You're part of what brings the world together. You make a difference. But if you're miserable with yourself and you're not at peace with yourself, you're not going to make anybody happy around you. You duplicate who you are, right? If you discover that everybody around you is miserable all the time, maybe it's you. <laughs> maybe, I mean, no, just think about it. Just happen. You know, when you meet really happy, friendly, smiley people, Everybody around them seems to be happy and smiley, right? You just, they just, it's infectious. But if you're, if you meet miserable people, you you kind of feel miserable around them. And so you can't duplicate something you are not. Your life makes a difference. Uh Uh-oh, a timer's going off. Does that mean my time's up? That's a timer. Who's timing my sermon? So your life does make a difference. But you can't duplicate something you are not. This is very important to understand. In Genesis 126, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move on the ground. You were created from the very beginning for a purpose. 
Now, I have a term that I want to bring to you today. It's an important term. It's called creation care. Creation care. Creation care is the realization that originally, when we were made, God made us to tend his garden, to care for the animals. He, we, the earth was made for us, not us for the earth. It was a gift that God gave us, like a birthday present for Adam and Eve. But he gave us the instruction to take care of the garden. We are to care for the resources and steward what God has given us. But there is a political term called climate change, global warming. And this is where we have to, as Christians, learn the conversations. Creation care is... God has given us this gift, therefore, because I hold it in high esteem, I will take care of it. But if you drop yourself into the political world, it is mankind is evil, earth is good, destroy mankind, preserve Mother Earth. And so these are the dividing lines. Climate change, man is bad, man is evil, man is causing this. Or creation care. It is my responsibility as a child of God to tend the garden that God has given me. You see the difference between the two? And so I was just having a conversation with some, some people the other day, some young millennials, and of course it's, it's all about climate change. And I said, I absolutely believe in creation care. And I began to explain this to them. And I said, listen, you and I, you don't know this, but we believe the same thing when it comes to preserving the integrity of of what God has given us. I'm not going to dump oil in the water, in the storm drain, right? I'm not going to pollute if I don't have to pollute. I want the same stuff you have because God has given us this garden called earth. And you, according to Genesis, you, according to Genesis, have been given the authority to rule over it. You have been given the authority to steward all of this. Steward the national park. Steward the, uh, the animals through fish and game. It's like there's things that we do that are stewarding. But ultimately, you are not the nemesis or the bacteria that's destroying. You are the ones created to care for what he's given. So your life is important. In the same way, you are to care for mankind, to love one another, to love your neighbor as yourself. But also, you are called to love you. And this is a sticking point for many, even Christians. If you refuse to love and forgive yourself, God can't fix that. I know, even in the church, many men and women who have given their life to Jesus, they've accepted the free gift of eternal life They've, they've accepted that Jesus could forgive them, but they absolutely refuse to forgive themselves. They know God loves them. They get it up here. They know they have eternal life, but they don't believe in forgiving themselves. And if you can't forgive yourself, you, how are you ever going to live a life that produces forgiving attitudes toward others? And so this whole month of June... Everything we're talking about is to get you to be a little bit introspective for the month and say, I love this person, I love this person, I love my family, I love my spouse, I love my God. I am going to learn to love myself. Because if you can love yourself, then you can lay your head down at night and have peace in your heart and sleep. Sleep. I know many Christians who do not sleep. I know a lot more non-Christians who don't sleep. When you're at peace with yourself and you see yourself through God's eyes, you sleep well. Genesis 128 says, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in numbers. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and every other living creature that moves on the ground. He's telling you, I want you to enjoy this life, but you have a position, 
of authority here. Never let anyone take you out of the equation. You have a purpose. I gave you this gift. It was a gift for, for humanity, and I need you to be part of helping bring unity to your fellow man, to investing in your fellow man, to loving your fellow man. But you can only do it if you understand that I have called you and that I love you and you are at peace with you. Easier said than done for some. Especially those of you who feel like you've done some pretty bad stuff. I know how difficult it is to forgive yourself. But we're going to work on this this whole month. I can remember when I was very young, I used to be, I grew up in a Catholic church and you would do confession. And as a little boy, I can remember the things I'd have to go to confession for. I remember, I, you know, I mean, I was probably three years old. I, I, I remember I did something, I kicked a, a, a cat or something. You know, maybe I was four. I was young. And I, I remember feeling terrible about doing that. I knew that was sin at that time. We have a, we have this brilliant not brilliant. We have this terrible ability. It's not brilliant. We have a terrible ability to remember all the things we've done wrong and are forgetful about all the things that we've done right. We are our own worst enemies sometimes, our own greatest critics. And we end up beating ourselves up because of what we did wrong and dismissing the good works that we have done that we've been called to do. It's time that we begin to look at ourselves like God sees us. And remember, we are valuable. He made us valuable. He loves us. He cares for us. And irregardless of anybody else's opinion, you are loved by God, and you are a valuable possession to Him. This is very important. And finally, you are worth sacrificing for. God thought you were worth dying for, and it's true. You are worth sacrificing for. If someone's willing to give their life for you, they must think pretty highly about you. Isaiah 53.10, one of the prophecies of the Old Testament, for the prophet Isaiah says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. God already, before Jesus came, had a plan to send someone to die. You are worth sacrificing for. You are worth dying for. God loves you so much that you are worth dying for. I, I, any, anyone here with a child would be willing to die for their child. No one has to ask you to do it. But God sent Jesus to die for you because you're worth it. Because you matter to Him. And the whole issue is the world continues to tell you that you don't matter. That you're not necessary. That you're just one of the problems that are damaging this planet. That is not of God. You are not the problem. You are part of the solution. The time of man will not last forever. There will come a day when Jesus returns and then he will restore the earth. And the saints will come with him. The saints will come marching in. That's where that song... God can show you his love but he can't make you accept his love. He can show you mercy, he can't make you accept his mercy. He cannot force you to love yourself. You have to allow yourself to do that. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. 
though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more value could you possibly have than the creator of the universe coming to earth as a baby, having his own son Jesus live a life that's sinless, and allowing him to be crucified as an innocent man on the cross to shed his God blood for you so that you would have redemption, opportunity to have forgiveness of your sins. I'm going to ask the communion team to come to the front right now because we're going to end the service with communion today. If you're here today and you have yet to begin a life following Jesus, I want you to start that life today. And the way we do it is we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins. We say we believe that he is Lord and Savior, and he forgives us. And the Bible says we become born again, which means we're made new again. We're made whole. You're, it's as if the old person has died and the new person lives. If we'd bow our heads for a second, just for some privacy. Oh, today's the day you need to get right with Jesus. Would you let me know? Say, Pastor, that's me. Just raise your hand right now. Let me know. Pastor, today I want to say yes to Jesus. Today is my day to get right with the living God. Amen. You can, you can look up now. And then we're going to receive an offering, uh, communion, and then our offering. And I do it this way for a reason. Many of you may be visiting and you don't understand our communion process and how that works, but I've given you this little form that goes in your sermon notes. What is communion? And communion is how we celebrate the fact that we're worth dying for, sacrificing for. Let me grab one of these. That Jesus, on his last night, when he was with his disciples, he knew he was about to be crucified. And they were eating together, bread and wine, and whatever. And he said, as they were breaking the bread, this bread, see this bread? It is my body broken for you. Every time you eat bread, I want you to think that I let my body be broken for you. You see this wine? This is my blood. I shed my innocent blood, so you would have forgiveness and you would have a new life. Every time you partake of this, I want you to think of me. And so we do this as a body. We come and we partake of the sacrament called communion. But also, we believe that giving our offerings to the Lord is something sacred. And so I ask you, we did, we're not, we did not take an offering during the service, but we're going to ask you, as you come forward, first, receive your communion with the, with the Lord. Take the bread and the juice and remember the sacrifice of Christ. And then after you've received communion, then leave your offering for the Lord. But do not leave your offering to the Lord until you are right in your heart with him. That is the beauty of this sacrament called communion. Would you stand with me? I'm going to pray a blessing over this communion. And then you're going to, the worship team is going to continue to worship. And I want you to get your heart right with God. And when you're right with God, come to the front, receive your communion, and then leave your offering and then go to the courtyard and I will meet you in the courtyard. I would like to keep a spirit of reverence in this room as people are talking with God. And if you need prayer, these ushers up here will also be willing to pray for you. So let me bless this communion, and then when you are ready to partake, come partake. So Father, we thank you. I take this bread, and I think of your suffering, your broken body. I take this juice, and I thank you for shedding your blood. But I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, 
that you'd help them in this month of June, this month of love, know they were worth, they were worth dying for, that you sacrificed yourself for them. And as they take communion today, Lord, let your spirit descend upon them and let them begin to love themselves again. In Jesus' name.